Well, it's a Saturday afternoon. Car is about packed and be driving to another revival meeting beginning there in the morning. But uh, today, we're going to begin a Bible study in uh, a book of the Old Testament. We have been in the New Testament for a while. I, I want us to focus deliberately at one of the smaller books of the Old Testament. We have most recently covered the Gospel of John, 21 chapters, and the book of Revelation, 22 chapters. And I thought that in the intermediate period here before our next study of a large book, we would zero in on uh, something with 8, 10, 12 chapters in that, uh, in that range anyway. Now, there are in the Bible several different kinds of literature. Let's think of the Old Testament. It begins with law, five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, legislation, how God wants his people to live. Then we go into the books, I would call them the books of history. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, Kings. And then we get into for 2 Kings, 1 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. We go into the books of uh, poetry. The books of poetry. Let me see if I can name them. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. And then the Old Testament rounds out with uh, the books that we call the books of the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, major prophets, their books are larger. And then Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, all the way through Malachi, minor prophets simply meaning their books are smaller. We have studied these criteria before. I feel led of the Lord for a few lessons to look into one of these books of Poetry. I named all five deliberately. Let me hold up a little chart that I made for us. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Now, did you notice something about one of those books, the titles of those books? Oh yes, Preacher Bagwell, it was larger, much larger. In fact, made bold and highlighted, yes, yes, the book of Ecclesiastes. Some of you will be excited because it's new territory for you, biblically speaking. Not a regularly studied book, I'm afraid. Ecclesiastes. Some of you will be disappointed because we're coming off of the thrill of the book of Revelation. But can I make an announcement? I hope I'll hear an amen. Ecclesiastes is God's word also. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that word inspiration, both in English and Greek, means God breathed. God breathed His very breath into every book of the Bible. Biblos, Bible, really means a library. And uh, God wrote every word of it through His Holy Spirit. So now we know at least where we are going to be studying the book of Ecclesiastes. Where do you begin? I, I think the best place to start 
here is maybe with a little bit of an introduction to the book. But I think I can do the introduction and teach, study, talk about the first three verses of Ecclesiastes as well. So I think I will label our class Ecclesiastes 1, 1, 2, and 3. This book has one of the most unusual beginnings of any book in Scripture. Let me read to you these three verses. I'm going to read them without comment, then come back and talk about them. The words of the preacher. That's so interesting. The words of the preacher. Are you telling me that Ecclesiastes has the words of a preacher? Yes. The words of a preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. That's verse 2. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. We're going to have to discuss that word. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he hath taken under the sun? What profit is it to all a man's labor under the sun? I'm already picking up. Are you, class, a tone of uh, apparent at least on the surface, pessimism in the book of Ecclesiastes. Oh, I need to tell you this. It is one of the uh, not only least studied books in the Bible, it is one of the most misunderstood books of the Bible. I'm going to put it this way. It is one of the most often criticized books in the Bible. And we're going to learn some things about it lesson after lesson. Twelve chapters, lesson after lesson, the Lord willing. We will not be involved as long as we were in the larger, longer books. But this will be a profitable study for us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. I mentioned 2 Timothy 3.16. And is profitable and is profitable. This study will be profitable for us. Verse 1. The words of the preacher. The words of the preacher. The noun there for words in Hebrew is dabar, D-A-B-A-R. And it involves, it suggests, it, in, it, it insinuates official words. Words that have required some pondering, some thinking. Uh, it, 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 it implies uh, words that have been approved by God. The words of the preacher. And he's not a false preacher. The words of the preacher, the bar. Now, that little, that little noun for preacher, listen to it. I, I'm going to, I'm going to pronounce it for you. Koheleth. Q-O-H-E-L-E-T-H. Koheleth. And uh, what does it mean, Brother Bagwell? Preacher. Preacher. But can you elaborate? Can you? And, and the vocabulary does allow us to do that. It uh, comes, they believe, from a Hebrew word that means collector. Collector. Now, this is going to sound strange being in Ecclesiastes, but the word means one who collects sayings, words. One who collects tidbits of, get this, you wouldn't think of it in Ecclesiastes, but it's true, bits of wisdom. One, one who collects uh, rules, principles for for living a successful life. That's sort of the idea. The words of the preacher. That word, Koheleth, is used seven times in the book of Ecclesiastes. A collector. It also means, they tell me, that the root of the word also means 
to assemble or together to assemble and that's what a collector is to assemble he will assemble a congregation he will assemble a, a readership to listen to his words as he expounds the great themes of the book of Ecclesiastes the words of the preacher now there is an appositive uh, phrase, the son of David. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Of course, David was king in Jerusalem, but by the way the sentence is arranged, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. One of David's sons, he had many. But one of David's sons that became king in Jerusalem well, now, boy, does that narrow it down. The son of David, who followed in his father's footsteps, who became king upon David's death, is Solomon. Solomon. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, for this class and for this preacher right here, this teacher. Solomon is the human author of Ecclesiastes. Now, the Song of Solomon, I believe Solomon wrote that. The book of Proverbs, we're plainly told the Proverbs of Solomon. And uh, so, but, but here specifically, Ecclesiastes, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And the word uh, Melech for king just means one who rules. One who rules. And in Jerusalem, of course, capital city for the people of Israel. The words of the preacher. I came across this little set of facts. I want to share them with you. In Proverbs, Solomon is the wise teacher. Come, my son, I will teach you words of wisdom. In Proverbs, he's the wise teacher. In Song of Solomon, he is the royal lover. We have studied the Song of Solomon, every verse. He is the royal lover, a picture I think of the bridegroom to come. And in Ecclesiastes, he is the, he is the, well, he's the king. He is the preacher. He is the preacher. He's a teacher in Proverbs. He's a lover, a bridegroom in the Song of Solomon and a preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes. I need to make just a passing comment here. I've already told you that in our class and for our purposes, uh, Solomon is the author of Ecclesiastes. In the commentaries that I have studied preparing for this series, over half of them, no, no, let me take out that word over, approximately half of them do not believe Solomon is the real author of Ecclesiastes. They believe that it is some wise man of the ancient Near East, uh, some, some sage of the Orient. But wait a minute. Our Bible say these are the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Uh, the only immediate son of David the successor to David is King Solomon. And there, someone said this, and I like it. When the Bible speaks, I'll speak. If the Bible's not clear, I'll not enforce it. I'll not be done, but the Bible is spoken. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So we're at least going to say that we have uh, come to the place that We've determined Solomon to be the author. He did not, uh, he did not assume the, the uh, monarchy, the kingship, without some difficulties and some problems. That would be another lesson for another time. Here, our concentration is on the book of Ecclesiastes. Someone said this, and I think I'll add it. During the reign of King Solomon... Israel reached her peak. Israel reached her peak 
And, and that would be that would be in the area of finance, commerce, business, and, and, and other areas as well, influence around the nations, and that might have been to Solomon's detriment of, of ultimately. Very successful king in many, many ways. But I, I want to say this, and I'm having to watch my time. Solomon started well. Solomon started, can I use an, an everyday, on fire for God. But Solomon, before his reign was over, had, and I'm going to use an Old Testament word, backslidden on Almighty God and had begun to follow the things of the world instead of the things of the Lord. We'll see that as we proceed in the book. Let's go to verse number. Let's go to verse number two, if we could, please. One of the better known lines in the book of Ecclesiastes. In fact, the word that I'm about to define is used, watch this, five times in one verse here. Listen up. Vanity of vanities saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now that's going to be, that's going to be hard to explain. Uh, let's talk about the word vanity initially. Um, hebel, let me spell it. H-E-B-E-L, hebel. Preacher, can you tell me what uh, uh, that word for vanity it is used 36 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. I counted them. It is used again, I say, 36 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Preacher, can you define it? Here's the way I want to define it, and then I will, I'll go a little further. Emptiness. Emptiness. Now, if you go to the lexicon, vapor. Like in the mornings, it's cold, winter's coming. I breathe out here on the porch and that vapor of my breath, warm uh, air that's been in my lungs, breathing out into the cold atmosphere, vapor, vapor. But it is soon gone. It immediately dissipates, vapor. There's another lexica, breath. Breath, watch. Breath, I breathe it, it amalgamates, it amalgamates into the atmosphere and it's gone. Breath, it, 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 it carries the idea, and I like this, I, I came across this illustration in one of our, the commentaries I consulted. It's what you have left when you pop a bubble out here on the front porch sometimes Debbie will play uh, with the grandchildren and, and uh, uh, they'll blow those bubbles and, and, and uh, little kids love it they'll run up to that bubble and pop that bubble what you have left when you pop a bubble so I'm going back to my original net emptiness nothingness that's what the word hebel means but then one more thing in order to get the uh, context Vanity of vanities. Now that blends and combines the word, doubles the word. Two times in verse 2. Vanity of vanities. Preacher, can you explain that to this extent? I can. Anytime in Hebrew when you get vanity of vanities, a doubling of, of, of a term, it is uh, expressing the superlative thought in the Hebrew language. And superlative means it's the highest degree. With our adjectives, we say positive, comparative, superlative, superlative, the highest degree. Holy of holies. In the temple, tabernacle, that's the most holy place in all the earth. King of kings, that's Jesus. None other king like him. 
Lord of lords to the none other Lord. He's the highest, the most superlative of lords. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to him. So it is whatever it means, it is superlative. Now, now listen. Emptiness of all emptinesses, saith the preacher. Emptiness of all emptinesses. Now listen to this. All is empty. All is vanity. Someone called Ecclesiastes. Yeah, I think I'm going to use this term in a way. Solomon's autobiography. Solomon's autobiography. And he is making this statement. Oh, I've got to get to verse 3. He is making this statement. He has looked around. He has, he has studied. He has applied uh, first one uh, worldly thing after another and he's come up with the conclusion nothing has meaning. Everything is empty. That's what he is saying. I've, again, I've got to get to verse 3. But can I make an announcement? If you're a born again, saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, child of God, this is not your outlook on life. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. All is vanity. Sure does sound pessimistic right here, doesn't it? All is emptiness. All is meaningless. I, I, I can't amen that statement just as it stands right here. I will when we get to verse 3. But, but, but uh, 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 listen to this. And we know, class, it applies to you if you're saved. It applies to me. And we know that all things empty, vanity, no, all things work together for the good of them who love God, who are called according to His purpose. So Solomon is writing this from a different perspective than I am enjoying and you're enjoying today. Let's see what he means. Let's go a little further into his deliberations. Uh-oh. This expression, vanity, might in some ways be the key to understanding the whole book of Ecclesiastes verse 3. I, I put it off as long as I can. What profit hath a man of all his labor, no matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter how educated, what profit, and I'll discuss the word profit with you, hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh, which he works, which he toils at under the sun. Under the sun. Oh, Brother Bagwell. Under the sun. That is a key expression. And I've got to talk about it a little bit here. Under the sun. That means not considering heaven. Under the sun. Life without factoring Almighty God, His love, His grace, His presence, His power into it. Now, if I'm just looking at life under the sun, if I'm divorcing life from Almighty God, if I'm considering life like much of America, like much of the modern world is done, I'm considering life with God completely out of the picture. Solomon's right on target. Emptiness. Of emptiness, all is empty. Education without God in the middle of it is empty. Philosophy without God in the middle of it is empty. The fashion industry, the entertainment industry, you name any area of life today without God seizing in it and smiling upon it and gracing it, it is empty. Verse 3, what profit? What profit? Um, Yithron. Y-I-T-H-R-O-N. 
Yithram. And uh, two times in our King James Bible, it means excellent. Excellence, excellent. Three times, put them together. Excellent, excellence. It, it, is, um, uh, it is a word that means well, what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun. Where is the profit? Where is the excellence in life without God? Where is excellence in any area of human endeavor without the Lord Jesus Christ being in the very center and the very middle of it? Wow. Wow. What a, what a different view than anything we have studied very far. Someone said this of Hebel, the word vanity. A mirage. That's something you think you see and it's not there. A mirage. Merely an illusion. A, a, a vanity. Emptiness. Take God out of life. I'm telling you, all you've got left is empty. There is a, and he's a heathen philosopher, Frederick Nietzsche. And I don't even know if I'm saying this right. Nietzsche. And uh, his most well-known philosophy is called, listen to this, nihilism. Nihilism. There are philosophers today who are advocates of nihilism. And what is nihilism? comes from the Latin word nihil. It means nothing. Nothing. This is what a nihilist would say. Family, it means nothing. We're all going to die. Money means nothing. It's all going to be eat up. By inflation. Uh, life after death. Why well, there's no such thing. Man dies and he's nothing. It's, it's nothing left. It's over with. It's done. See they're not accounting God and heaven and eternity. They don't believe in it. Everything is nothing. This is going to be an unusual and a delightful God inspired book to study. Oh, oh, oh. Let me say this. It begins with the word vanity. I mean, we're in the second verse, third verse. And it ends with the word vanity. But by then, Solomon has taken it and he's put it into context and he's put it in a way that God can smile on it. Ecclesiastes 12, I won't have time today, verses 10 and 11. We'll find out that, that everything, finally Solomon's going to get it all pieced together Everything will fall in place to the honor and glory of God. If you quit living life under the sun and realize there's a heaven, there's a God, there's a throne, there's a Lord Jesus occupying that time. Hey, let, let me tell you, it's my life verse. Let me read verse 3 again. What profit hath a man of all his labor? No labor is profitable which he hath taken under the sun, under the sun. And yet, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, you Christians get ready to holler, Hallelujah. My beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Wow. Life is empty, not if you're saved. Every morning His mercies are new. Every morning great is His faithfulness. Lamentation 3, 22. Psalm 68, 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily, daily loadeth us with benefits. Mm -mm. That word labor, Solomon used in verse 3, to toll to the point of exhaustion and experience little or no fulfillment in your work. That's a labor under the sun. That's a labor without God. <laughs> Other terms that are going to come up. Evil. He's going to talk a lot about evil. Joy. Can you believe it? In this dark book. So far, dark book. Joy. He's going to talk about, and he's going to talk about foolishness. And he's going to talk about wisdom. And he'll use God's name 40 times. Never Jehovah. Always El Elohim. But 40 times. 40 times. He's going to use the name of all mighty God. I'll take God's truth. I'll take life above the sun. I'll take life viewing my heavenly Father. 
God help us, help us as we study the book of Ecclesiastes.